honored guests. I have served the leadership of my country, the United Arab Emirates, for almost five decades in a variety of roles. I spent 40 years as interpreter and advisor to His Highness Sheikh Zayed, the late president and founder of the UAE. I have experienced his vision of leading his country in a very uncertain world towards a more secure and prosperous future. I have also served the next generation of UAE leaders who have continued the legacy of the founding fathers of our country. And I have seen world leaders in their exchanges with my country's political leadership and observed those who succeeded as well as those who failed as leaders. So when I speak of leadership, I am mostly focused on political leadership. However, I believe that my thoughts are applicable to other settings as well, be they in the business or the social world. The Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana observed, echoing the wise words of my colleague, His Excellency the Minister of State, that those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. The history of the world is a never-ending succession of triumphs and failures of leadership. And again, following the footsteps of my colleague, the, as a background to the challenges and needs for leadership qualification for modern times, it can be instructive to just look briefly at the history of the past century. It was certainly a century that saw, without a doubt, the most impactful failures of moral and political leadership in the history of the world. Weak or unprincipled leaders unleashed xenophobic nationalism and racism, totalitarian leaders committed mass murder on an industrial scale, and tens of millions of people perished in wars of aggression that redrew the maps of Europe and the world. A lack of political leadership resulted in failure of other countries to confront these evils while there still was time, and weak national leaders at the close of the World War I did not have the necessary political backing at home to create an international system of collective security that would have been strong enough to prevent World War II. And against the background of the incomprehensible suffering of World War I, II, the world community found respite with some dramatic and inspiring success stories when the victors of the war led what then was the international community and formed the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions. Their bold objective was to make future wars impossible and spread the benefits of economic development around the world. That period also witnessed an unprecedented surge of nations breaking free from colonial rule, as my colleague said. In some cases, this led to spectacular success stories, as we have it witnessed over the last seven decades in the world's largest democracy, India. However, in many other places, self-serving elites to this day play a game of divide and rule while plundering their country's resources. The auspicious beginnings of the UN were, of course, soon eclipsed by the start of the Cold War, which gridlocked the international system and which turned the newly independent countries into pawns on a global chessboard, with proxy wars being waged in third countries such as Korea, Vietnam, and Afghanistan. Social scientists estimate the number of people killed during that century by government action alone in the hundreds of millions, including deaths caused by wars, genocide, and mass murder. At the end of the 20th century, however, it looked as though the world might have learned the lessons from both the bloodletting of the first half of the century and the stalemate and gridlock of the second half. 
The fall of the Berlin Wall symbolized the start of a new wave of nation states becoming truly independent and joining the international community in their own right, while the international coalition that liberated Kuwait seemed to herald the bright promise of an international security architecture that finally worked as intended. A euphoric feeling of the end of ideological history and the beginning of a new era in international relationships based on law and justice that would enable nations to work together for a better future for mankind seemed to invade public sentiment. I still remember the exchanges our leadership had with world leaders of that period that attested to that new confidence and faith, one that would justify the theories that the world is witnessing a new era, one in which an utopic final form of human government working for the common good of mankind in accordance with international law will somehow prevail over the cynical view that might is right, that cultural and religious identities spurred on by populist leaders would become a primary source of conflict. Surveying the world scene today, we sadly realize that those feelings of euphoria and hope were short-lived and deceptive. Both in our region and worldwide, scenes of violence and destruction, of economic malaise and environmental disasters, of rudderless countries whose peoples are experiencing confusion and lack of direction, all combined together to warn us that the disasters of the last century, once believed to be firmly behind us, could well raise the dreadful head to threaten our very survival. Today, more than at any time in our history, the need is manifest for a new kind of world leadership, one that is capable and resilient, adapted as your ideas conclave surmises to the requirements and challenges of the 21st century, a leadership that is inclusive, collaborative, and of service to the individual, to its community, to the ecology, and to the world. We were fortunate in the United Arab Emirates to have just such a leadership to steer our nation's destiny at the birth of our federation some 46 years ago. I had the privilege of witnessing firsthand the transformation of the UAE from a small fledgling federation of seven emirates located in a very dangerous and volatile part of the Middle East into a success story of peace and prosperity, both for its own people and for millions of residents from more than 200 countries, including a large Indian community who make invaluable contributions to the social and economic progress of the UAE. Born at a critical juncture of the history of the region, out of coming together of seven small emirates in 1971 to create a modern state in the face of existential threats and challenges, lacking in all the basic infrastructures of politics, economy, and security, surrounded by conflicts and frontier disputations in a rough neighborhood that was strategically important for the world community. I still remember how the world greeted this new political formation with incredulity and doubt. It became, however, quickly acknowledged today as a successful modern state that managed to establish in record time of its from the foundations a prosperous and advanced society based on education and sustainable growth. Its spectacular achievements allowed it to assume a position of preeminence both regionally and internationally, to play an effective and responsible political and economic role, and to contribute to the stability and security of the region while becoming a leading aid donor to global 
humanitarian causes. It is difficult to reconcile this image with that prevailing in 1971, which I remember as the rulers of the Trucial States met at the Jumeirah Palace in Dubai on the 2nd of December 1971 and proclaimed the establishment of the UAE, the prevailing impression amongst most observers at the time was that this new political entity lacked the basic requirements of statehood, possessed scarce human and economic resources, and was unequipped to survive the challenges of that period. How did that happen in the face of such overwhelming odds? What type of leadership brought about this transformation? The UAE's remarkable story of achievement is largely founded on a successful historic leadership that was able to harness the creative energies of its people to surmount all obstacles on its path. What has perpetuated this success story was that the founding fathers recognized the imperative of building a strong generation of successors who continue their legacy today and steer the nation's destiny into its future. And in looking back at our recent history, I think it appropriate to draw on Max Weber's typology of leadership or authority. He distinguishes between three types of leadership, the traditional authority of a hereditary ruler, the charismatic authority of an inspiring political leader, and the legal or formal authority of the head of an institution. The late Sheikh Zayed was able to integrate all three of these types of leadership, which made his brand of leadership very effective and very resilient. He was a traditional ruler who commanded the loyalty of the local tribes because of his lineage, but he did not stop there. He also was a charismatic leader who inspired people at home and abroad through his political vision, his strong moral compass, and his dedication to alleviate humanitarian suffering. And he built the normative and institutional underpinnings for a modern state, providing the legal or formal authority necessary for running what today has become one of the 30 largest economies in the world. The legacy of the founding fathers of the UAE is carried forward by today's generation of UAE le leaders in a way that is reminiscent of Henry Kissinger's description of a national leader as someone who formulates a powerful vision for the future of his country and who then leads them towards that vision. In that process, the leader pushes the outer boundaries of what is possible in the political, social, and economic context of his society. In other words, leadership does happen from the front, but the leader never gets too far ahead of the people. The leader challenges old assumptions and fosters change, but the leader does so in a way that brings society as a whole along on the journey. I have seen this brand of transformative leadership in action for five decades now across a broad spectrum of issues. The empowerment of women alluded to by my honorable colleague is something that is an issue of paramount importance to Sheikh Zayed. Today's government of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai, has nine women serving in the cabinet. One of, them, one of them, as Minister of Youth, was appointed when 22 years old. Another example is the transformation of the UAE from a hydrocarbon economy to a post-oil economy. Given the UAE's rich endowment with natural resources, that may seem counterintuitive. But several decades ago, our leadership recognized that a purely oil-based economy would be unsustainable and drove an ambitious diversification agenda. This was neither cheap nor convenient, 
but it provided for a much more resilient economy. Today's leaders are taking bold steps in reducing petrol subsidies and introducing low levels of taxation, all of which broadens the economic base and reduces dependence on hydrocarbon revenue. Achieving sustainable development depends not only on geographic location, abundance of natural and financial resources, and demographic factors. It also depends on an environment conducive to development, which primarily consists of an effective government, a creative and smart administration, mechanisms that promote investment and entrepreneurship, and an advanced and sophisticated system of services covering all fields. The UAE has been aware of these prerequisites since the time of the late Sheikh Zayed. Under the leadership of his successor, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, of the Vice President and Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, and the Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces and Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the country has become a pioneer in government reform in the Arab world and in the region, providing the highest standards of government services. And to ensure that its services are delivered in an optimal fashion, the Smart Government Initiative was launched in 2013. The Prime Minister described Smart Government as one that never sleeps, provides fast delivery, and strong procedures, is innovative and adaptive, serves the citizens at any time and everywhere, inside and outside the country, improves lives, and responds to expectation. And to help achieve these goals, the government of the future was announced just recently in 2017. The prime minister introducing new ministry portfolios to consolidate the ways of dealing with the future challenges that we will face, nominated a Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, a Minister of State for Advanced Sciences, and a Minister of State for Food Security. And launching the UAE Centennial 2071 program, the Prime Minister said that its target to make the UAE the best country in the world by 2071. However, this vision for our country and for the region is not without opponents. Our government, in Your Excellency, is certainly aware of the scourge of extremism and terrorism that threaten world stability and is taking a clear line in the fight against global extremism. When the Founding Fathers discovered in the early days of our country's existence that parts of the UAE education system were at risk of being undermined by proponents of political Islam, they did not hesitate to take decisive action and revamp the system. We are a Muslim country, and this is an important part of our identity in the 21st century. But we cannot allow our religion to become an instrument in the hands of those who would twist the meaning of Islam and abuse it and abuse it for their political goals. Today, our government is leading the fight for the hearts and minds of those who are at risk of being misled by extremist messages online rather than ceding the field to the extremists. None of all these policies have always been popular across the region, not in the days of the Founding Fathers and not in the present day. Our leadership has taken risks in implementing these policies, but as Nehru famously observed, the policy of being too cautious is the greatest risk of all. And finally, while our government has been focused on the sustainable development of its economy, and the provision of the conditions that ensure the happiness and well-being of its citizens and residents, it has always taken it as a central duty to extend a hand of help and assistance to all those countries and individuals it could reach out to. This was the humanitarian dimension of Sheikh Zayed's unique leadership. 
one that is fully reflected in today's policies. According to OECD reports, the UAE for the past three years has been the biggest donor country in the world to humanitarian causes relative to the size of its economy. And the UAE aid has, has been only humanitarian and for humanitarian objectives. It is neither government by politics, nor is it limited by geography, race, color, or religion of the beneficiary. This policy was laid down by the founder, Sheikh Zayed, who stressed that foreign aid and assistance is one of the basic pillars of UAE foreign policy. So, to come back to the opening, I believe that the 20th century holds important lessons for the 21st century because the 21st century, after all, has not witnessed the end of history. The international rules-based system which the UAE supports and depends on is still in gridlock over some of the most pressing issues on the global agenda, from the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction to disorderly mass migration, to the degradation of the environment or the challenges posed by the uncontrolled rise of artificial intelligence. My lesson for political leadership in the 21st century is that we have to be aware of the consequences of failure. These consequences, these consequences are staring us in the face from the ruins and missed opportunities of the 20th century. We cannot afford to be complacent or to resign our fate to other powers. This will require political and moral leadership. We in the UAE are prepared to defend the achievements of the founding fathers of our country. Our region is facing an existential crisis stoked by outside powers intent on weakening national governments and establishing pliant proxies in the stead. The UAE will continue to confront those powers within the limits of international law and in close cooperation with our allies inside and outside our region. And we have to proactively shape the future of our societies like we do in the UAE by setting challenging visions for the future development of our country our region, and hopefully for the world. Thank you.